All right, we are here with Katie, and um, we're on a, a third visit to the dentist, but a second visit for her therapy work. And uh, she's been through a lot, and has has some multiple uh, multiple things going on, and and really multiple aspects to her care. But before I get into that, Katie, can you summarize? And I know there's a lot to it, and it's not an easy thing to summarize. But the I, I know we've talked about a brain fog and chronic fatigue as kind of two of the more central and significant things that you've experienced. If you were to summarize what your, your, your history has been and your, your chief concerns or complaints have been as to why you came and, and required care and intervention in the first place, what would you say? I would say um, I grew up as an athlete doing lots of different sports. Um, I used to train for triathlons and then I went to someone who couldn't physically do anything more than a yin yoga practice. Um, I couldn't maintain working in a classroom, even with a teaching assistant. I couldn't follow the schedule because I had so much brain fog. Um, I couldn't sleep two or three hours a night. Um, I had chronic pain all the time. And um, I was probably on about 12 different medications at my worst point. Wow. <laughs> there's there's a lot to that right. and for this and, and you'll recall when we first met we talked about a pattern that your body has acquired mm -hmm. and part of that acquisition of that pattern came from below your body's pattern up from right. your feet we analyzed your feet and we talked about recommendations for footwear and and a, a custom orthotic insert to help guide your feet correctly from below and then Dr. Lamb and, and her dental staff have talked about guiding your body and your body's pattern correctly from above. And we've worked on um, changing the occlusal state, the contact your teeth make on this device, this pata, this splint that goes on your lower teeth to help redirect where your body moves based on how your teeth contact. But we also wanna unlock your your, the, the bones in your skull and release a cranial strain pattern and so you have an ALF also that, that clips into your upper teeth and helps unlock this whole body pattern. So the pattern that your, your head and your skull has acquired does not feed negatively into the pattern of your neck and the right. pattern of your body. So there's kind of a two things from <laughs> above, one thing from below taking care of a pattern in the middle. But at the heart of all this lies a tongue restriction. So you have a grade four tongue tie and that tongue tie's uh, impact on your body is that 2,000 times a day you swallow. And if your tongue is not able to come up to the roof of your mouth and engage your palate and keep that skull bone, the maxilla, the palate bone, operational, unlocked, moving, and mobile with each of those 2,000 swallows, then your body can go in other directions and start to acquire these patterns and start to acquire these bite restrictions or bite limitations and also these palate cranial bone limitations. And so, so that tongue restriction is something that we're now at a crossroads and we're preparing you for a tongue tie release and a series of lip tie releases. To do that, we wanna train your body so that it can have the preliminary support to support that. We also are gonna have you work with a myofunctional therapist. That's a therapist that works with the tongue and provides training exercises for your tongue so your tongue can learn how to do what it's going to do when it's released. Okay. It would like to do it now, but the restriction <laughs> in the tongue won't let it. Okay, so the, so the, the, the facets of your program are to uh, address your body's problem so you don't feel this brain fog and this chronic tension and fatigue, but to do so, all of the things that are driving or causing you to go back into your pattern, we have to iron those out. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the next item on our treatment plan is this tongue tie release, but there are some exercises that the tongue or the myofunctional therapist will help you with. And we're gonna assess your body pattern and progress your exercises and then make sure the, the ALF and what it's doing and, and the ALF is not, it's not designed to unlock your palate or to be a palatal expander or try to change things in your skull as much as it's designed to help what your body and breathing pattern does have favorable action on your palate. And so we got to make sure the ALF adjustment and fit and everything is just right. 
and the adjustments on the splinter just right. And Dr. Lamb will help us with that today. But I'm interested in what your body pattern is and helping progress the training of your body pattern as we make a plan and shift into gears where we we're moving to tongue training. So let's lay you down on the table, okay. take a snapshot of what your body pattern is and is doing, okay. and then um, okay. advance your training exercises so that things are pulling in a direction that allows your body to support your neck and so in a neutral place so your neck can support your skull in a neutral place. Okay, fair enough. I'm gonna turn your knees up to a bent position. We're very interested in what three regions of your body, your pelvis and your sacrum down here, your rib cage and your sternum and your breastbone up here, and then your middle part of your neck. We wanna know which direction each of those in your pattern tend to pull and rotate back into. We diagnose that correctly, then we deliver and administer the exercise treatments, then they help hold your body untwisted so an untwisted body can support an untwisted neck and it can support the base of your skull so you don't have this ongoing headache and fatigue, you know, brain fog and, and experience that you've had. So if we look here at your trunk and I hold your rib cage and rotate your trunk in each direction, I wanna know which side goes further and how it feels at the end of each side, okay? So we'll rotate here first to the left and note how far that goes and how that feels at the end. Again, I'll hold your lower rib cage in place so that it doesn't rotate as your low back and hips and pelvis rotates. And as we come and rotate toward the right, I have an assessment of the distance it rotates, but I'm really interested in from you how it feels when we get to the end of that rotation, okay? So with me first going left, and then second going right, which one feels more restricted to you? To the right. You're pointing to the left. Oh, this way. When your knees go to the <laughs> left, okay? So you feel restricted when your knees come to the left, and you feel less restriction when your knees come back to the right. Yes. Okay? The amount of motion is slightly increased as your knees come back to the right, and you can feel, and I can feel less tension in your body, in your back and in your hips and in your body as that comes back yeah, I here. I feel it in my back and hips a lot. Okay. So we're 65 degrees moving to the right, and as you go, as you go to the left, this is the side you feel more restriction. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this side moves well, but it has a tight feeling at the end. Mm -hmm. So here you're able to move and rotate. a similar distance with a different end feel, okay? So your pattern has a tension tendency when your knees rotate left that doesn't exist when your knees rotate right, okay? Now as we move up into your rib cage, we're gonna assess your ability to rotate your shoulders and bring your arms back and move in positions on both sides to learn about what your rib cage and what your sternum's doing. So I'm gonna hold your shoulder joint down into the table and carefully rotate your arm from straight up down toward the table. And as I bring this down, we have a restriction on your right side. It hurts. And that hurts at the end of that motion. About 70 degrees out of the desirable 90 or 100 degrees that we'd like to see. And on this left side, we have more comfortable motion and more complete motion moving all the way down to the table at 90 degrees. Okay, slide over to this edge. When your pelvis and spine rotate, your sternum can end up compressed and rotating in that same direction or in an opposite direction. When you originally started, your sternum was turning and rotating away from this left side toward the right side. And we'll assess that again by holding your arm straight, your wrist up, holding your collarbone and rib cage down into the table and seeing how far your arm comes down from straight out and this comes back, it'd be nice if this arm went straight back, but this comes back about 65 degrees. Now we come over to the other side. Before we started, I had a hard time just doing a T on the floor with both my just arms. Just to have out. both arms straight out. I remember that, it wasn't comfortable at all. Really even to lay on your back. Same thing here, wrist up, elbow straight, holding your collarbone and rib cage down into the table. We drop this arm back and we see how far it goes until it starts to bring your whole body and rib cage. And this side goes further, 
nearly 80 degrees with some tension at the end, but the distance it turns tells us a lot about which way your sternum is, is positioned to pull and compress and turn, okay? Now I want you to slide back to the middle of the table and slide down a little bit. And when you slide down a little, I'm gonna have you bend your knees and slide down a little bit. I'm gonna bend this table down so I can have access to this area to provide a measurement for your neck. I'm interested now in what the middle neck segment, C3, 4, and 5, are able to do rotating in both directions. I'm going to hold your mid neck segments with my right hand and turn them carefully to the left and, um, and give any feedback from you as we go to make sure that this isn't, uh, that, that what I do isn't, doesn't set anything off or isn't too comfortable or too uncomfortable or too awkward for you. But I'm gonna hold your mid neck and I'm gonna turn the mid neck segments left. And you feel that restriction as we turn to the left. So we get 10 degrees and with some overpressure work toward 15 degrees and that's pretty uncomfortable. It is, <laughs> it's uncomfortable. And then we hold this same position in your neck and we turn and rotate it to the right and we have a lot more motion going back to the right. So this is an intact column five pattern, an intact right lateralized pattern with your pelvis being the most neutral region of your body but slightly oriented toward the right. Your sternum is very oriented toward the right and actually your neck is the most oriented to the right. And so from the neck down, this drive coming from your head into your neck is the more significant prominent feature that's holding on in your body because good things are happening as we correct your body from below, okay? Mm -hmm. So at your neck, this goes nicely to the right, but when we go to the left, this middle neck segment is very limited. I'm gonna take your neck segments and bend them from side to side. Create a fulcrum here and bend laterally in one direction. Create a fulcrum on the other side and it's much more comfortable and goes further. So we go about 25 degrees to the left and an uncomfortable 10 degrees to the right. We're limited there. Your lordosis in your neck is restricted when you're turned into these patterns through your rib cage and neck. Do you feel how this is tight here and restricted? Yes. And then another measurement we're going to assess is called OA lateral flexion, which is where your skull rotates in one direction and, and uh, approaches your upper neck on each side. So C1, called the atlas at the top of your neck, mm -hmm. is, a, is a significant bone to understand in multiple dimensions. It's important to understand which way it's rotated. It's also important to understand how much compressive support from your body is provided at each side of your neck so that when I tip your head toward the top of your neck, I, I get to a contact point that feels like a stable end feel. And when I go to the other side, I wanna to get to that stable end feel as well. The end feel, when I move the head to your neck, tells me that your body is grounded uh, sufficiently below your neck to hold your neck up so that when I move your head to your neck, there's something there to feel. So of all the tests we do, this is the one test where we, where we want a nice limited number to feel secure and we don't want the number to be really loose, okay? So you're gonna feel me create a lordosis in your neck, squeeze the base of your head, and then I'm gonna tip your head to the left. So you have 10 degrees of mid cervical, or excuse me, OA lateral flexion. OA lateral flexion to the left is 10, and OA lateral flexion to the right is more like 25 or 30. You feel that difference? You feel how coming back to the right, that's much more yes. uh, loose and free. On the surface, you'd think, wow, that's great. We got a lot of motion here and this side feels tight. When in actuality, what we want you to feel is this tightness over on this side. Oh, okay. Because that tells me that this body, this, this half of your body from your hip to your pelvis to your abdominal cavity to your rib cage, it has ample compression and support to ground and support your neck so your neck is held up well from above so that when I tip your head towards your neck, we feel that 10 degrees and it feels nice and solid. Over on this side, you, you have a unique body pattern because the way your body is turned is toward the right, especially at the rib cage and neck, but your ability to be grounded is deficient on the right and is excessive on the left. 
So okay. I'm learning from your head that there's a little bit of a mixed pattern here. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that comes from the tongue's inability to tie all this together, mm -hmm. to get your body neutral and to get your body grounded. There's two things. We got to get this body untwisted. But just because it's twisted a certain way doesn't mean that it's grounded well a certain way on the side it's twisted to. Okay. So when in many cases, a body that's twisted and compressed on the right like yours is, is better grounded on the right and that shows up all the way to the head. Mm -hmm. In your case, you're, you've got better support coming up to the head from the neck over on this side. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take our training to the right. Your training is going to involve heavily going into the right side and getting good standing on your right leg using the right abdominals um, and, and, and really um, compressing your body on the right with your breathing so that that body compression can hold your neck up better. Mm -hmm. But we have to make sure everything coming down, including the process of the swallow with your tongue, and including the mobility that comes from the ALF and the contacts that come from your splint device on your teeth, that all of those help keep this body that we're trying to untwist to the left, but compress and ground on the right. Okay, okay that's what we're putting together here for you. So that we have all those thoughts down. I know we've, we've explained some of this as we, as we went through your evaluation and talked about it, but I'm interested in now in making sure that uh, that your occlusal grounding bias, what we feel when, we, when you bite together and, and, and how much force you're able to develop, I want to see that that, I want to see if that matches your body compression that's showing up at your neck. And then I do another thing called a grounding performance test. So now I want to see how your grounding is up here. I know how it is at the base of your head and your neck. I talked about that. Now I want to know how it is at your teeth and then I want to know how it is at your feet. And that's going to guide me in my exercise prescription. Then before I start, I'm going to have Dr. Lamb come in and I'm going to see if we need to make any adjustments to your dental devices and appliances to get us where we're going so that we don't have to overwork or do too much with our body training and make sure that we're getting the full, the full uh, benefit from the devices. Okay? All right. So let me uh, grab a, um, I don't want you to tip your head back as I bring my fingers in. Okay. I don't want you to feel like you're a bird that's eating a worm over his head <laughs> okay. kind of a thing. I'm just going to come in. I want you to open your teeth. And I'm going to come in here, and I want you to, I'm going to come along your top molars, and I'm going to have you draw together, slowly, carefully draw together, and I want you to bite down on where my fingers are and attempt to prevent my fingers from coming forward and coming out. So Dr. Lamb, she has a right biased occlusion that I can feel as soon as she bites, and then as I attempt to escape, this right side is able to be held and this left side releases. You can see her limitations in her tongue. Um, she has a scalloped nature to her tongue. So you see this scalloping along the outer border of her tongue on the both side, front, and the other side indicates that her, her tongue limitation is something that she stabilizes her body with and she thrusts her tongue forward into down. her teeth. Down, down it's drawn down and thrust forward. And actually, it's starting, it works with her neck to help with her breathing. She's really using her tongue to help offset what her abdominals and her diaphragm are unable to do for normal breathing and movement. And she stabilizes with her tongue in an attempt to get stable where her core is not able to allow her to get grounded and compressed and stable. Can you so, take your tongue out for me? Um, you can see the line there. It's very prominent. Close down. Uh huh. Close that open and go. Go ahead and close your mouth. Uh huh. With your tongue inside <laughs> and swallow. <laughs> swallow and then open real wide. And you can see that scallop. Close down. Yeah. Swallow and open. Do you see that? Yeah. So swallow. The tongue's supposed to go up, up to the palate. But her tongue in a swallow goes down and leverages. So in her swallow, she uses her, her swallow to control this rib cage and manage air, when really that's the job of the diaphragm and not the tongue. And so in doing that, the cranium ends up being strained. And that's why we see some of, this, some of the shape of her palate. And we'll show you later on that palate. See the shape of the palate, the way that it looks is, um, brought to you pretty much by a tongue that is doing a lot more than it's supposed to be doing, 
causing a lot of cranial strains. That cranial strains cause bite issues, cause TMJ issues, neck, neck and shoulder issues. That's why I get so tired of chewing. That's why chewing is hard. <laughs> Absolutely. So, where's her ALF? Um, oh, it's in. It's in. It's, okay. it's in. Dr. Lamb, before we check the ALF, it may, it may help me with where I go with her next phase to understand where her grounding performance is. Mm -hmm. Do we have a second to let me check her grounding performance? Um, did you, you test want... her before and after ALF already? No, she's come in. This is her with the ALF. And this is what she said, just to bring you up to speed. Yep. When she got the ALF that first month, uh -huh. she felt good things happening with the, the strain in her head and the pain along the right side of her head, upper back, and low back and neck. Okay. And then the last time she had it adjusted since then, she's felt the previous pains return and tension return along the right side of her body, and it, and it hasn't felt the same. Yeah, because the right side is now passive. She's had movement on the right side, so she. I need to adjust it. Perfect. I can see it on the right Perfect. side. Do you see how the class is no longer fitting here? Mm-hmm. It's because her body has already moved from the previous position, so I just need to follow along that. So, here's. She's got a stealth design elf. There you go. So the ALF works in its springiness. If you notice when I do this, you see how it's springy? Mm -hmm. It is not the same thing as orthodontic wires. What this, the, the springiness from, made from a special alkaloid gold wire that's a very thin wire. This is not an orthodontic wire that's made to move teeth. This is actually a special wire that helps to unstrain the cranium. And so it does it through the um, it does it through this vibrate the micro vibration. So when a patient wears this, and um, it's in the mouth, in each swallow, the teeth will come together and hit the occlusal surface. The hitting of the occlusal first surface causes that vibration. And if you see, there's an omega loop. There's three omega loops: one in the front and two in the back. So it works off. This works off the swallow. So when you swallow, the tops of your teeth hits this, it puts a vibration followed by a tongue that does a wave, okay? The wave will help this, these omega loops vibrate and open like this, okay? In doing that, this, this, the palate is comprised of, in the front, two bones that come together with a central fissure or connecting joint, and the two bones in the back doing the same thing so that you get one that is um, anterior-posterior and then one fissure that's transverse. So through the swallow, these omega loops that you see here ends up unstraining the cranium from this mid-palatal suture and from the suture between the nasopalatine and the anterior maxilla. So once it unstrains the cranium through that with every swallow, the entire cranium around it is also unstrained. So Can you talk about what adjustments you're making? Yeah, I'm just opening up a loop because that right side is really strained. So I'm giving a little help because, you know, she's made adjustments with her own tongue. And sometimes the metal has a threshold in which it can be malleable. And so it's met that threshold. So I basically just go in, I adjust it to follow the changes that she's had thanks to the glorious work that she's been doing at home unstraining her body, which translates all the way up to the head and neck. And so once that happens and things unstrain, sometimes her palate doesn't fit this the same, and I just need to follow the palate. I'm not initiating anything here to crank her open or anything. This is not a palatal expander. She's making changes because her swallowing is improving because her diaphragm is working a little bit better. We're not where we want to be, but we're definitely have made some positive changes because I'm seeing that in here, okay? She has a way of getting this in. I'm gonna let you put it in. So you know the angle best, right? You don't even see it. It's all in the palate.
I can remove it. I need a little bit more. Yep. Yeah, it's been really sore the whole time this time. The first time it wasn't so sore. It was sore? Mm hmm Like the, like the my, jaw felt sore? Like my teeth, my upper teeth feel really sore. Felt sore. Like I can't bite hard things anymore. Okay. Here you go. Can you feel the difference? Mm, hold on. There we go. Mm -hmm. Does that feel a little different yet? Maybe it's hard to tell because it's, it's been hurting so much lately. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a little bit more. I don't feel like it's fully there yet. What are you trying to change so that this she's, the she's tooth feel? the tooth didn't fit against this because she has already her her jaw has already made some changes so all I'm doing is opening up the loop to fit with um, to have this fit against the tooth where it's supposed to so it's kind of dental technical stuff that's mm -hmm. okay go ahead. Do you feel a little bit more tension? If not, it's okay. I can do more, but I'll probably need another. I don't, um, can't tell? I can't tell because it was it, it felt like a lot of tension in my mouth to begin with. It actually feels like less tension now. Okay. Because before it felt like it was like just pressing everything and mm -hmm. hurting. Okay. So I think this part, you don't have to film this because yeah, it's okay. your thing. So Katie came to us with zooming us a lot and um, what I discovered in her examination is that she has a grade four tongue tie. And a grade four tongue tie that is compensated. What that means is when she lifts her tongue up, the floor of the mouth comes with it. And she's been able to do that to speak, to you know stabilize, to walk, to eat, to, to move um, and chew and swallow. She's been doing that with a lot of compensation from, from neck up. That part ended up causing her whole body compensating with the neck, head and neck. So our point is that um, we've gotten her to a point now that she's learning to properly use her rib cage, engage her diaphragm, her obliques, her hamstrings, her glutes to breathe properly. So because of that, she's ready now for a tongue release. And um, the tongue release is typically done. Um, however, the reason it's so important to look at body before a tongue release is because if she's using her body to stabilize herself and, and um, help her breathe, then if you take somebody's stability and you, you, you release that, then where would she end up stabilizing? I've had patients come in that have um, reported anxiety after a tongue release. Well, I would have anxiety too if the way I've been breathing is to stabilize my tongue and now that's been robbed from me. Even though it was a good thing to get a tongue release um, so that you can nasal breathe better, uh, it gets robbed from me. And, I, and some people come in and say, oh, ever since the tongue release, I felt really good. And then, you know, three months later, I started having pain between my shoulders or they'll, they'll compensate in other ways now that you've taken away their ability to, to use their tongue to stabilize. And so what we do in, uh, in this case scenario is we like to get her breathing properly. And then now Katie's actually ready for myofunctional therapy to get, to get her tongue functioning properly in order to for a tongue release. So we've got backup. So now that the tongue who's been doing all the work 
is about to get released from all that work, we got to make sure that whoever is supposed to be doing the work, from the rib cage to the head and neck muscles, um, the, that they're coming along for the ride and they know what their responsibilities are and they're doing it. Okay, so I'm going to show you what a tongue tie, grade four tongue tie looks like. You may want to get some close-ups. Let me see how it, how, so she was not able to open this wide before. She came in with locked jaw, mm -hmm. right? She was able to open maybe, not a, even two fingers, not even two fingers width. And now she's a, she has full range. She's got 45, 46 millimeters, which is full range. And the reason she couldn't before, because she had a dislocated, internally displaced disc from the clenching, uh, like just chronic clenching over the years because she's using her tongue and her jaws and her neck muscles to stabilize her whole body. She ended up dislocating her joints and locking her joints. After the ALF treatment, within, what, two weeks or so, she was able to open up fully. And open real wide for me, good. And take the tip of your tongue and touch up to the roof of your mouth this spot. Can you see how it has trouble doing that? Mm -hmm. The other part that you'll see is right here, the floor of the mouth is raised up. The except of the salivary gland is in those little nodules right there. And that's supposed to be at the floor of the mouth, but she has lifted the floor of the mouth up. Go ahead and lift your tongue up. So, because when you swallow, this tongue is supposed to be able to go up and form a wave with your palate. But when you're tongue tied, it can't do that. So you don't swallow as well. You don't digest as well. And um, so if I, if, if I hold her floor of the mouth down with this tongue guide, now I want you to take the tip of your tongue and touch the roof of your mouth. Do you see how it can't? Now you can close your, your jaw to do that, to achieve that. But don't mm -hmm. close all the way. Open as much as you can while you're able to achieve that. Yep. Right there. Okay, so she's right. If she's what we call a tip to spot, she's at 20 millimeters. So 20 millimeters means that her ability from her maximum range, which was around, I think she was at 46, 48, and she's uh, her tip to the to the incisive papilla is only 20. That's more than you're having to close more than 50 percent just to be able to to get your, your tongue up there. So we consider that a grade grade four, grade three, four-ish. It's very, very heavy. It's, I mean, what is the percentage of that? More than 50% more than is a grade two, I mean, a grade three. And then 80% is about a grade four. So if we, and then go ahead and go tongue to that spot again. Uh -huh. And can you suction up? Mm-hmm. Go ahead and suction. See, she can't su form a nice cave suction. And you see all this engagement of the tongue here. And look at her neck muscles to do that. Go ahead and do a suction. And look at how she's using all this neck muscles just to do that. So every time you swallow, you're having to engage all of this, pull your, pull your rib cage up, which throws you into extension. And now your diaphragm's not set up with a nice zone of apposition to do its job. So that this is why a tongue tie could be so detrimental to the entire posture, the entire way your body is stacked, so that it can optimally move side to side, forward, you know, and back. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, Dr. Lamb, in her reassessment of your tongue, learned that when you initially met us and presented, you were a grade four. Okay, the ability for you to open your mouth and then the ability for you to put your tongue up on that spot behind your front teeth and open your mouth showed a significant restriction in your tongue. You were a grade four. That's the, that's the strongest grade of restriction you can have. Now, we've started your training. You've got the dental devices in play. You've got the foot orthotics and the exercise activities in play. And you went from a grade four to a grade three. We need you to be a grade two, a really functional, and we need you to be up better than that. And that's where this tongue tie release is gonna come in. Okay. But we didn't wanna do the tongue tie release when you were just a grade four with a body pattern 
and with drivers from below and drivers from above that we're going to predispose your tongue tie for limited success, we want to predispose your tongue tie and your lip tie procedures for maximal success. Makes sense. So I'm going to now measure your body because Dr. Lamb has done the ALF adjustment today. And remember, she's not adjusting anything to move things with your skull. It's your breathing and your swallow and your body movements that we're training you on that actually are helped to unlock your skull. We're, with the ALF device, we're trying to keep up with what's unlocking and changing. So we're trying to match the changes that your body's making so that so the ALF is in place, kept keeping up with your body so that all your breathing and the tongue work and the swallow work that you do continues to make progress. So it's there's a, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what an ALF is and does. I know you know here with us that we're, we're trying to help your body unlock your neck and your palate and your bite and all of those things. And, um, and then make sure that these areas stay unlocked so they can in turn keep your body unlocked and you can feel like the undone version of you that doesn't have fog and headache and strain and all of those chronic issues. So now I'm going to remeasure, especially the upper part of your body through your rib cage and your neck to see if the adjustments that Dr. Lamb made to match your ALF with your palate and the subsequent breathing and swallow that she's done as a part of the tongue assessment, if that, if that takes your body to a different place, then I'm going to reassess your grounding. We've looked at your grounding on your teeth. We've looked at your grounding at the base of your skull when your head tips side to side. Now we're going to look at your grounding against the wall here. And then that's going to take us to guide us into our next exercise for you. Okay. okay? And we're going to blend that with, and you're to the point right now where you can get the tongue exercises or the myofunctional therapy. Now we're going to go get good myofunctional therapy to prepare for your tongue tie. And we want your body to be preparing you for a successful tongue tie release so that everything goes together the way that it's supposed to with the highest possibility of success. So let's lay your head down here and we'll reassess this. You'll remember before, and I'll do this again, you'll remember before, I saw similar movements when I turned your knees side to side, you felt a restriction going left. Now I see more movement in both directions, especially the left. You feel that? Yeah. Does that feel looser to you? Yeah, it doesn't hurt. That certainly looks looser to me looser. And, and moves better. And it hurt at the very end of the movement. When you got to the very end, it would hurt. The very end back. hurt. And this doesn't have that feeling of hurt at the end. And that obviously goes further. I mean, we're going 80, 85 degrees to the left. And as we come back to the right, they both are pretty similar in how far they go and, and how they feel to me. Is that similar to you? Do you feel that change? Yes. Yes. Okay. And this was the part of your body region that was the least turned into its pattern. Let's make a note that we've done swallow work and we've done adjustment to an ALF. Clear up here at your skull and we've seen a positive impact down here. So it is very likely, almost, almost for sure, that your neck is different and your rib cage and sternum are different because we took a change here and we saw it manifest down here. Some good things have had to occur here. So let's snapshot those and look at those. How that shows up for a rib cage that had a sternum turning this way and compressing a rib cage and pinching a shoulder blade in is that the arm doesn't turn down comfortably, but when that ALF unlocks your, your palate, your skull, and your neck, and we saw it manifest clear down to your hips, some good things have occurred through here. So it's likely that this is much more comfortable and feels great like this yes. when, I, when I turn that it down. It was painful before. It was painful and it didn't go all the way. No. Now it goes all the way, a full 90 to 95 degrees comfortably and both sides match. And I'm gonna have you stay on your back and slide over to the edge. The other thing that happens when your palate unlocks, your neck is able to unlock and move across both sides and your breastbone is able to unlock and move freer and further in both directions. And so that shows up when we test how far your arm can come back. So if you slide over here, there we go. And we do this same supported assessment, you'll just see that that comes back much easier and goes much further, indicating that your breastbone has been able to unlock and rotate and move and pivot over to this left side, whereas before it didn't, okay? Now we'll come over to the right. So that's 90 degrees, and we bring your 
shoulder and rib cage over to this right side and with a little over pressure we're able to take your upper arm to where it angles and faces straight down so that's improved in both directions okay. back to the middle and have you slide down a little bit i'm really interested in your neck okay so slide down and i'm going to lower this table so i can get in here and have access to your neck i'm interested in your neck's ability to rotate toward the side that was restricted, which is to the left, and you feel that's a lot more comfortable and moves a lot oh. better, okay? Oh, yeah. Now, we want you to know, we're excited about this, but we're really excited about keeping this like this long term. Me too. And that's where the tongue release comes in, okay? So we want you to know that we're excited about the mobility that your feet and ankles have helped your neck to receive. We're excited about your exercises through your body that have helped your neck. We're excited about what the ALF just did to help your neck, but we know you swallow 2,000 times a day, and we want that tongue to continue to massage. I'm going to set your head down. We want that tongue to continue to allow that palate to expand and rotate and shift and just stay unlocked and mobile, and the restriction you have in your tongue is less likely than when we met you, but still likely to cause that to fall back and you to fall back into that pattern. Because remember, we saw some good things and you're like, man, this feels great, I like that, but oh, I'm not doing as well. Something is like pulling you back mm -hmm. and we're gonna make sure that nothing pulls you back, okay? But this gives me an idea of where to go with your training techniques today. So her, her cervical rotation in C3, four and five is able to rotate fully to the left end of the right, really at 35 degrees. And as she moves from side to side through the middle of her neck, this mid cervical lateral rotation, she has good motion to her right and to her left at 30 degrees. Probably the most exciting part about what's occurred today with that little bit of tongue assessment, but mostly the adjustment to the ALF, is her neck's ability to, to lordose or to bend, bend upwards and backwards like this is freer and easier and more comfortable. Do you feel that? Oh yeah, from, it actually feels good with you stretching like yes, before, from your, it, before it was painful. From your shoulders to your head, your neck should function like a slinky that I can just put my fingers behind and elevate and lift up. And when we have that movement that we need across both sides of your palate, at the roof of your mouth, across both sides of the base of your skull, both sides of your neck, and both sides of your sternum and rib cage, then this neck is just a very comfortable slinky that you feel like a relief for me to do that. And it moves freely and naturally as opposed to that restriction that's such a problem. So that cervical lordosis is very valuable. And then, so she has full cervical lordosis, Alex. And then her OA lateral flexion is going to guide me in my grounding training that I'm about to progress in advance for you. So if I support your neck in a slightly lordotic state and I provide some compression to the base of your skull, I'm going to tip your skull towards your neck, toward the left, and assess that moving 10 degrees. And then I assess this side that moves 20 degrees. Okay? So going to the right has less support from your body into your neck so that when I tip your head to, to hit into your neck, your body needs to give more support to your neck so your head can hit it firmer and sooner and easier. Okay. So this is the test that's almost backwards from a lot of the other tests because mm -hmm. we don't want high, loose, relaxed movement and numbers. We want to create the grounding that you need to support that. Okay, the next test we're gonna do, we've already, I've already had my fingers in your mouth and we've looked at your occlusal grounding and that had a bias to the right. Now that Dr. Lamb has adjusted your ALF, I'm gonna redo that test and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a test that we've done before called the grounding performance test with you laying on the right side and your feet against the wall, okay? So I wanna know if what's occurred in the unlocking of your palate has changed the way your teeth are able to contact one another on the right side and the left side. Earlier it was all right, okay? Remember, I don't want you tipping your head back. Oh. There we go, right there. And I'm gonna have you slowly, carefully come together with your teeth onto my fingers and hold that, 
hold that, bite a little firmer, and you're way better able to hold this left side. Now you might be slightly right biased, but wow, before you were not able to contact your left molars into one another to hold my finger on this left side. Do you feel how that's improved? Uh -huh. Alex, she has a she has a near symmetrical grounding performance but she still is slightly biased toward the right. But be okay. okay. Now here's the problem. I overthink things, <laughs> you overthink things, and together we can really overthink <laughs> things. But on this test, I'm just gonna keep this super simple, okay. okay? I want both feet on the wall. I'm gonna raise you up a little bit. I want both feet on the wall. And as you with both feet can feel into the wall, we're gonna assess your ability to feel and then to deliver push or pressure into the wall with both feet. Don't overthink it. I'm gonna draw two lines on the board, okay? This is called an AIA grounding performance test. And it's really a test for me to learn what it feels like to you to be able to use the top half of your body to put pressure into the floor and to use the bottom half of your body to put pressure into the floor. It's really the wall. Then I'm gonna see how well you truly are able to put pressure with the top half of your body and top leg and the bottom half of your body and the bottom leg into the wall. And we're gonna compare and learn and that's gonna help guide me because I already know up at your head that your, your, your body is not giving you all the support that your neck needs for that test called OA lateral flexion mm -hmm. that we looked at. The head thing, when I tipped your head to the right, it was looser. I also know that your bite is evolving and changing. It's going more back toward a balanced state, but it's got a slight right bias to it. And your body pattern is now not patterned toward the right into the, into the sternum turned right and neck turned right. You untwisted. But being untwisted is not the goal. Being untwisted and being balanced with your grounding on both sides is really the goal. So let's keep this super simple. You're laying here. You can feel your shoulder against the floor. You can feel your hip, but you're just laying here. Stacked shoulders, stacked hips, stacked feet, and your feet are on the wall. Without worrying about left or right, I want you to take your top foot and engage it into the wall. And on a 10 point scale, I want you to tell me when I lay here and push into the wall with my top foot, it feels like I can generate the amount of push or pressure into that wall of maybe a five out of 10 or a seven out of 10 or a two out of 10 with higher numbers being uh, closer to 10 okay. and not having any strength or push pressure at all ability would be down closer to zero. Okay. Don't overthink it. I just wanna know what it seems to you you can do mm -hmm. as you engage this body designed as it is, compressed as it is, and this leg push into the wall. Top leg, and you're gonna then relax, and you're gonna give it a number. Then you're gonna do bottom leg, give it a push, and give it a number. And then you'll relax them both and do it again, and we'll just take a snapshot. Okay. Top leg pushes, then you relax. Bottom leg pushes, and then you relax. Can you give those a number, or can you tell a difference? It's, it's, it's huge difference. The top feels like it feels like, I would say a 10. Like, I feel like I'm You feel strong. super strong. So you felt- I feel like I can put as much pressure as I want to on that one. Okay, so you feel a 10 out of 10 on the top when you push into the top. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. Now, when you relax that, and then still lay just like you are on the right side and push with the bottom foot, what number do you feel that foot can deliver into the wall? Maybe like a two? Like, uh, I, I feel like I'm barely putting pressure on it. So that feels a lot weaker. So yeah. to you, it feels like a 10 and a two. That's significant. That tells me that you already know that your ability to be grounded is dominant on the left side and that, that the perception of being grounded on the right side is really poor. A lot of people can't tell right off the bat and I need to do this second phase of the test for them to know, but wow, a 10 and a two, you can kind of already tell, okay? Now here's what I wanna do. I want you to hold your 10 foot into the wall and your two bottom foot into the wall, hold the 10 and the two together and hold on to them. And then I just kind of assess that. <laughs> and yeah, you're a two. <laughs> now again, hold the 10, which is top and two, which is bottom. And I'm gonna give a pull here. And yes, I agree. So I concur with you. And, and, and we don't always agree when we do this. Some people feel a certain thing. And then when I check it, they're like, wow, I didn't know it was that different. What's cool is you already knew. So now your OA lateral flexion up at your head that was so soft when I bent your head right, 
supports with this right side being a two that both your perception and my assessment of your reality agreed with. So actually, I feel a 10 and a two, and you have a right grounding performance of a two out of 10. So I'm gonna train that, and we're gonna build on the training that you do laying on your right side when we do that, okay? I've been compensating for that. Like, I feel like I'm left-footed now. If I have to step down, I step down on my left rather than my right because my right feels so weak. I don't feel like I can. It doesn't feel like it's there for you. Right. I'm afraid it might give out on me. This concept of grounding is so central to the successful rehab to be achieved and then maintained. It's so big. I love that you feel that. I love that you can tell you're solid on your left foot. And we want you to hold on to that and to gain that same ability to be solid on your right foot, which means I need your right abdominals, which means I need your right inner thigh, which I need your, I need your right hamstring. I also need your left hip and buttock to support this process. I wanna show you a version of a, an exercise that's laying just about like this that we do, and um, you're gonna scoot into the wall a little bit closer, you're going to take your bottom shoulder and you're going to draw it a little closer to the wall or towards your hip. So you're, yep, just like that. Bring your pillow. I want you to have a really thick double pillow when you do this, okay? okay? And I'm going to take this rolled up foam bolster of a medium firmness and put it high in your inner thighs so that you can learn how to take your pelvic diaphragm, which are the muscles of on the front part of your pelvic floor, and help them work with your abdominals and your respiratory diaphragm, and help the pelvic diaphragm and respiratory diaphragm work with your mandibular diaphragm, which is your tongue. Now your tongue is already getting some good work and making progress. You still need a tongue tie release and you'll get that. But I want to train you for success with that procedure by already helping your pelvic floor, pelvic diaphragm, and respiratory diaphragm work with your tongue. So your tongue has two allies to help every breath that happens in your life help your tongue do the right thing. Okay. And then every time your tongue's able to do the right thing, I want it to help these other two diaphragms do the right thing. So we're gonna do a really simple technique. We call this an, a, an AIA right side lying grounding technique. Okay. In a bent position like this where your hips are bent, your knees are bent, and both feet are together on top of each other like this, I want you to feel the wall with both feet. And I want you to feel this rolled up bolster with both thighs. But especially focus on the bottom foot and the bottom thigh. I'm going to need your abdominals, especially the bottom abdominals, to work with the bottom inner thigh as you take this perceived number of a two pushing into the wall and take that number and start bumping it up, okay? But here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna synchronize diaphragms and help you get there. I love that you're breathing through your nose. I want that to continue. Okay. I'd like you, when you blow out, blow all the way out, I'd like your rib cage to compress together on both sides and almost be like the entire front of your body rolled together like two scrolls just tightening up mm -hmm. and compressing. So you're gonna become tucked in, buttoned in, and tightened up, okay? And I want you to stay tucked in, buttoned up, and tightened up through here. Mm -hmm. Holding those ribs drawn together and drawn back a little bit with your hips and butt tucked under a little bit, you're gonna push into the wall and breathe maintaining the tension in your abdominal wall in the front part of your torso, okay? So it's super simple. You're gonna to try to stay tight through this whole front side. You're gonna remember that both feet need to push, especially the right. Both thighs need to squeeze, especially the right. And by the way, this, this motion of squeezing into this helps your pelvic floor be supported and held open so that when the muscles of your pelvic floor contract, your pelvic floor can elevate, okay? So it's a, it's a two feet, your that? hips are tucked, okay. and your ribs are both drawn in on both sides like this, okay? okay? So you're gonna hold that state and breathe, and when you breathe in, you're gonna nasally breathe in through your nose, and I'm gonna help facilitate by putting my hand under your hip, help facilitate what I need, which is more right abdominals, more right inner thigh, and more right foot pressure into the wall, okay? Go ahead and breathe in and blow out. 
As you blow out, remember, draw the scrolls together, roll each side of your torso together, nice. I love the pressure I feel into my hand. You've got pressure here and pressure into the wall. Now you're gonna hold that and you're gonna breathe in through your nose. This is it, you're doing it. And you blow out again with the goal to create more tension, a little more squeezing, a little more pressure into the wall, especially on the bottom right side, good and you hold clusal grounding, and then I'm gonna check your OA. In fact, Alex, why don't I start with her OA, yeah. lateral flexion. I, again, I provide that lordosis, I squeeze the base of your skull, and I tip in one direction, good, and I get 10 degrees, and I go this other direction, and it's 10 degrees. You just trained your body to support your neck. So the top of your neck was in place when I bring your skull to your neck, we're in great shape. So she's 10-10, Alex, I love that. Yeah. Her grounding into her foot says that training on the right side is what she needed. Yeah. Her, 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 uh, her OA, Lateral flexion says that the training on the right side is what her body needed, and now I'm gonna assess her grounding performance. And this is something that we may need to employ Dr. Lamb to make sure that what she's doing with the device on your teeth, this PADA, Pattern Altering Dental Appliance, is taking your body in a direction that complements all of what we're trying to do here, okay? So here I come again, and I'll have you draw together. Good, and hold that, and bite a little firmer, bite a little firmer. And Alex, this girl is E then. I cannot get out of there on either side. Go ahead and open up. Well done. Do you feel that difference? Mm -hmm. Do you feel how good you are on this left side? Mm -hmm. So I grounded your body on your right side. The base of your skull felt it. The pressure into the floor with your foot felt it. And it changed your support for your cranium. So your bias with your teeth going right is no longer going right. And it's even. That's awesome. Isn't that cool? The thing about it is your presentation and your asset, when, when you reported to me, hey James, I'm no good on the right side. Oh, no. And then I checked your work to make sure that you weren't crazy and I wasn't crazy and I'm like, yeah, no, you're no good on the right side. You're not grounded, you're not put together. But your head had already told me that. Mm -hmm. Now the teeth can be a wild card. So your occlusion, I wasn't fall, I, I was noting what your occlusion gave me. Mm -hmm. Your occlusion matched your body pattern but your head and your feet told me about your grounding pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's different animal. And that's, yeah. that's real live life. That's when you say, I feel better. Yeah. That's when you move better, you train better, you're strong and powerful, that's grounding. So understanding a pattern is really kind of only half of it. Right. You have to know what to do with the pattern, mm -hmm. but even that isn't the answer. You have to know how to ground this baby out. And that's right. what we did today. We grounded you on the right side. And that'll complement your, your right what we call G-Hope, you know, that foot on the box and G-Hope and finding the tummy and finding the butt. All that's gonna go a lot better now that you have the adjustment to the ALF and that your body's grounded the way that it is, okay? So we're gonna get you in touch with a myofunctional therapist, which is a tongue therapist. Okay. She's gonna start a bunch of tongue exercises that are gonna help prepare you for success with your tongue release. Okay. This program is now having your body help prepare your tongue for a successful tongue release because at the end of the day, I want that tongue which we call the mandibular diaphragm, to work with your respiratory diaphragm and to work with your pelvic diaphragm. And you're gonna be feeling like a new woman. You're gonna be feeling like this all the time. So we're not too excited about you getting to this unless we're sure you can stay like this. I don't wanna stay like this. Feels good. Huh? You feel better? I do feel better than when I came in because I was having a lot of pain. Nice, that's awesome. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Good stuff. All right.